Robots Radio presents... Hey everybody, welcome into the podcast. We're back with another special bonus episode. Bonus episode! Today we're returning to our Top 5 series. Brad, I am such a big fan of this series. I really enjoy doing these Top 5 lists with you. Yeah, they really give us a chance to kind of, I don't know, stretch our legs a little bit, delve into movies that we might not necessarily watch for the podcast, but I think it really lets us get into some of our favorite movies. Brad, you came up with such a great idea for today's top five list. Why don't you share with our listeners what the topic is going to be for today? Yeah, this week's top five is going to be top five movies that I would like to see a remake of. And this might not necessarily be like, oh, this movie sucked and I wish they had done it better. It might just be like, hey, this is an old movie that I absolutely love and I'd love to see a modern take on it. So I'm really excited to get into this topic, Bob. I I feel like our movies are going to cover a vast range of cinema history. Yeah, I think so, too. And while we're doing it, we're going to be sipping on Three Chord Bourbon. Now, Three Chord is a small craft distiller that's making some waves in the industry now. I first saw them featured on Instagram. I reached out to their distillery. They were nice enough to send us a full bottle of Three Chord. Uh, We are drinking their blended bourbon today. It is 81 proof. Their claim to fame is that they use a special process to uh, enhance the aging process. Uh, It was founded by musician Neil Giraldo, and his idea was, you know, look at what happens when I set my glass of whiskey down on top of my amp when I'm playing guitar. What if we could find a way to make vibrations in the barrel as it ages? Would that do anything to the complexity and the flavor of this bourbon? Some people think of this as a gimmick, uh, but but Three Chord has gone all in on it with their advertising. It's definitely uh, the story that they're selling to us, and I want to see if their whiskey is up to par, if it's any good. You know, whatever their process is, at the end of the day, what Brad and I are looking for, is this a good whiskey, and is it affordable enough to recommend to our listeners? So we're going to be sipping on that as we get into our top five. Oh, I'm, I'm not looking for that at all. All I want to know is... <laughs> The music that they play to it, do they just play the same three chords over and over? <laughs> bom, 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 and they just play that for like four years straight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Brad, let's get into it. I want to hear your number five movie you'd like to see remade. Yeah. So my number five movie that I would like to see remade is 300, directed by Zack Snyder, came out in 2006. This is a movie that I actually, like, looking back on it, I remember enjoying it a lot, you know, when I saw it. But there's something about that movie where I think that they have the bones of something that could be an interesting story, but it's such a stylized piece of work. I'd really like to see a remake of that movie done more in the style of like a Braveheart or a Gladiator, something a little more realistic. I, I think it could make a really amazing movie. So I, that was actually going to be my question was, do you want to see a remake of the movie 300 based on the graphic novel by, I think, Frank Miller, which is what that movie was? Like it was a shot for shot, basically remake of a comic book. Or do you want to see something with the subject matter of the, three, the 300 Spartans done in a, a more historical kind of fashion? Yeah, I think it would be interesting to do it in a historical fashion. You know, I, I really liked the movie. I'm, I'm not saying that I didn't like it. It was interesting. It was violent. It was graphic. It, you know, it's everything you would want in a quote unquote guy movie. But I think that it could be done in a historical fashion. You could bring in the politics of the age I think it could be done really well, like I said, as kind of like a Braveheart type movie, a little more realistic. Yeah, I think that's a great idea, Brad. And and Hollywood actually had the same idea as you back in the early 60s. They did make a movie called The 300 Spartans, and it came out kind of in that same era where they had been doing Ben-Hur and Spartacus. It was in that historical, they called them like sword and sandals epic kind of style. But even then, if we're going by that basis, it's been almost 60 years since we've had a film adaptation of that material. And you're totally right, Brad. I think that the the story of the 300 Spartans is just a super compelling tale to begin with. Yeah, I think you could easily turn it into a film where you see them, you know, become a part of this unit and fight and some of them die. 
well, all of them die, spoiler alert. <laughs> um, but like, I think it'd be really cool if you followed a few people's lives and their families and you saw them die. And then maybe the end of the movie is something of like, you slowly see the difference that that battle made on the, you know, on the Greek culture and so on and so forth. I, it just seems like it could be a fun, interesting remake. Yeah, I think that's a great pick for your number five, Brad. For my number five, I'm also going to go back a couple centuries. I'm looking at Mary Shelley's classic novel, Frankenstein. And in particular, I'm looking at the 1931 version, the the Boris Karloff version, the universal one, the classic version of Frankenstein. I don't think that that movie has ever been topped when it comes to movies about Frankenstein's monster. And that book is just so full of, you know, social commentary, but it's also just really dark and full of like body horror. And I think that it is prime for a really dark sort of remake that we haven't gotten. They've they've tried and tried again to reintroduce Frankenstein into the public consciousness. Just a few years ago, they made a movie called I Frankenstein. I just don't think anyone has really gone back to the source material and taken it seriously enough in a way that you would see from certain directors nowadays. I even think about the guy that made the the, the two It movies. I'd love to see his take on the historical Frankenstein story, not changing it for Hollywood, but really making the story about a person who's so obsessed with creating life and playing God that he's literally stitching together you know, dead body parts and then animating it and watching as his creation kind of tears things apart. It's a brilliant story and it's such a great morality play. And I think it'd be cool to see it brought into the 21st century now that we can go a little bit further with the horror elements of it. And you know who I would pick to play Dr. Frankenstein in that, Bob? Hugh Jackman. Edward Norton. Oh, Ed Norton. That'd be a great one. Right? Like, I'm honestly thinking about The Prestige. Like, it, it, if they made a Frankenstein movie that had something of the similar mysterious feel of The Prestige with Ed Norton as Dr. Frankenstein, I think you could have a spectacular movie. I do, too. And that's the thing is you can't go overboard with the sort of campy, low budget horror elements of it. It has to take the psychological portion of it seriously. And I think the tone you're talking about with the prestige would be perfect for it, Brad. Yeah. And if there's ever an actor who takes the psychological side of things seriously, it's Edward Norton. All right. So that's my number five. Brad, why don't you hit me with your number four film you'd like remade? Bob, We're going to move back in time quite a bit to a movie that we have reviewed on this podcast. The movie that I would like to see a remake of is On the Waterfront, directed by Elia Kazan, came out in 1954. I just, I loved the story of On the Waterfront so deeply But, you know, if you go back and listen to the episode, I I think that you and I both struggled with a lot of the ways things were portrayed in that movie. We struggled with a lot of the decisions that Kazan made. I just think that you could remake On the Waterfront and do an amazing job with it in the modern era. What do you think, Bob? Well, I'll say a couple things. First of all, I agree with you that I think it could be remade. But the second thing I'll say is that I think we might be among the only people who would think that because this movie, like we said back then, is held in such high esteem and high regard that I don't think anyone would want to mess with the Brando performance because it's one of the most famous movie performances of all time. With that said, Brad, I actually had On the Waterfront at number six on my list. It just missed being in my top five. I honestly think we could take another pass at this. And the reason that I left it off the list isn't because of the movie's reputation or anything like that. It's because the person that I would pick to star in this movie is too old to do it at this point. And I don't know of a young actor who can pull off Brando quite as well. So until there's an actor in my mind that can do it, I don't know if I would be all in on a remake of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, but you're just going to leave us hanging and not tell us the actor who's too old to do it? The actor that I think would be best for it would be Tom Hardy. Really? Huh. That that's Tom a- Hardy gives off so many Brando vibes. And I think between Tom Hardy and Leo DiCaprio, you've got both sides of Brando's personality. You've got like the really macho side and the more light feminine side to it. But Tom Hardy, I think he just takes so many cues from Brando. He visually he kind of looks in the face a little bit like Brando. 
And I think that 10 years ago, this would have been a perfect project for him to jump into. But he's like 44 years old now or something like that. I just don't think that he's he's quite young enough to do it anymore. Yeah, no, I think that's a phenomenal pick, Bob. Who would you pick to play Brando in this movie? Oh, man, that's really tough. What would you think about John Krasinski? See, he's also too old. I mean, he's approaching 40 as well. I think the reason this movie worked is because Brando was still in his like early 30s at this point. He's playing a washed up boxer, but with the mentality that he has in the movie where he's kind of a slow guy, he's still talked about as younger than everybody else in the film. I don't think you can have an actor that's older than like 34, 35 playing this role. I think if you wanted to do something really interesting and modernize it, you could look at an actor that's from a different like ethnic background. You could pull in like a Michael B. Jordan, I think would be really good for this film. But there just aren't a lot of young actors in Hollywood that I think could bring that sort of macho edge to it with a, a really delicate underside the way Brando did. Yeah, I mean, Brando just has so much confidence in that role. I, I guess I'd agree with you. It would be hard to find somebody like 28 to 35 years old to fit the bill. But I think it's a great pick, Brad, at your number four. For my number four, I'm going a lot more lighthearted and a lot more modern. I'm going back to a movie that came out when I was in high school, and that would be the movie Hitch, starring Will Smith. Man, I I love the movie Hitch, but I, I don't know if we're going to review it on the podcast, but I'll just spoil it. I really do not like Ava Mendez in this movie, and I really think that a remake could really get that casting right and make a phenomenal film. So I actually went back and watched Hitch, I don't know, two, three months ago probably, because I was like, oh, I haven't watched this in a while. I remember loving this movie, and I have got to say, this movie is not aging well, first of all, in the age of Me Too, but also just because it's a really poorly written movie. It falls into all the pitfalls of a cliched romantic comedy, and it's super depressing because I think that the setup of the movie, the plot of the movie, it could be potentially a classic. This idea of a guy who is a date doctor who hooks people up, kind of falling in love himself. And it's a really great idea for a movie. The problem is that I think they they use a lot of the female characters in a manipulative way. I mean, that's kind of the point of the movie is he helps guys manipulate women into relationships. But also the whole point of the movie at the end of the film is that he learns that none of his his ways of doing things actually help anybody any more or less because they didn't work with Ava Mendez and he needs to learn you know, how to put all that behind him and blah, blah, blah. But the way that it goes about doing it is in such a cliched, overdone, overwrought way. And I love parts of this movie, but I feel like if we did it with a little bit smarter of a script, with a little bit more input from the female characters, that if you if you round them out a little bit more. And like you said, Brad, the Ava Mendez character, like her whole deal is she's, you know, she's the standard rom-com lady. She's mean and she's cold, but she really wants to be in a relationship, but she's a workaholic. It's like, why does the female character always have to be a workaholic? Like, why can't we give these characters a little bit more of a well-rounded background? I think if we took another stab at Hitch, we could really do something with it. And I'd love to see a remake of it. Yeah, I think the main reason that that movie had such enduring power was because the on-screen relationship between Will Smith and Kevin James was dynamic and fun and it just sparkled. They like they just performed so well together that I think their relationship in the movie is the reason why it was so popular, but I agree there's many opportunities to make that into a much much better movie. All right, Brad, what do you say we take a break and we try this three-chord blended bourbon? Let's get to it, Bob. Okay, so Brad and I are here with this bourbon poured out in front of us. Now, like I said, this is 81 proof, and they describe it as a blended bourbon. They say that it's a blend of up to 12-year bourbon, which I don't know what that means as far as how young the bourbon is. It's not categorized as a straight bourbon, which means I guess the youngest in it could potentially be under two years old while the oldest in it is up to 12 years old. So we could be potentially running the gamut of the, the ages of the whiskey that are included in this thing. Brad, what are you picking up on the nose of this whiskey? I might be crazy for thinking this, but it kind of reminds me of scotch a little bit. Did you get that at all? Yeah, I, I think that what it is, and I've been really like, I really like this whiskey a lot. But you're right, it has that sort of like briny, bright 
smell to it. I think it smells more like an Irish whiskey to me than a Scotch. Yeah, um, but it smells. I think maybe it smells a little young, but it has a lot of floral notes to it and a lot of fruit notes to it, and it doesn't have those classic dark bourbon notes at all. But I really love it. I think like I'm gonna sound really dumb saying this, but I just kept writing in my notes like this is a lovely smelling whiskey. It's just very lovely. Like it's it's something I could see myself drinking on a summer's day and just sipping on it and not feeling a buzz from it, not feeling a headache from it. It's a really light, easy whiskey. Man, Bob, I want you to continue with this word picture of you sipping it on a summer day. You know, what what smells are around you? What's across the street from your porch as you're sitting? I, I really want to know more. So what I am picking up on this whiskey in particular is I'm getting a lot of citrus, like almost a grapefruit kind of smell. But underneath all of that, I'm getting a ton of pear. It smells like ripe pear. And I really, really love that scent on this. Like I said, there's a little bit of floral to it as well, Um, but that's really the notes that you get on this. It's kind of perfumey, if that makes sense. Yeah, it totally does. I'm really interested in in this, Bob. Let's give it a sip. Oh, I like this a lot, Brad. Yeah, this is an interesting whiskey. I, I like your comparison to an Irish whiskey. It's very bright. There's not much burn from it. I'm, you know, I'm gonna be honest. The Kentucky Hug isn't really there. But this is a fun whiskey. I I like all the floral notes that I'm getting. I like that tiny bit of kind of saltiness, that briny that you were Mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. This is an impressive whiskey. Yeah, and I think that some of those fruit notes are actually there on the taste as well. Like I really did get like some peach, apricot maybe flavor on this. It has this really great sweet candied fruit taste. And then with that, like you said, it's the classic notes of an Irish whiskey. On the finish, I do think it's a little bit bitter. It doesn't leave a sweet taste in your mouth. But what it leaves is a an almost floral kind of like aromatic, if that's the right word. It, it almost has that sort of like flowery flavor to it that it leaves on your tongue. I really, really like what this whiskey is doing. And I think the word that I keep coming back to is like perfumey, not in an overpowering way or a bad way, but it has that sort of light quality to it. And it's just a really unique, distinctive whiskey. Yeah, honestly, Bob, coming into this, I... I won't lie to you, the gimmicky nature of their advertising made me doubt if this was going to be a good whiskey. And I maybe that's a bad thing, but I am really impressed with this whiskey. Whether or not the playing of three chords over and over made this whiskey better, I really like it a lot. It is an impressive whiskey. And man, if this is what it takes to make a good whiskey, keep playing your music three chord. Well done. Yeah, I'm really impressed with this stuff. If you can find a bottle of three chord, Brad, honestly, I think if we were reviewing this like for a score on one of our regular episodes, I would give this at or near a 40 out of 50. This is a really phenomenal whiskey. It's different than any kind of bourbon I've ever had. And it seems really like an alternative to bourbon for when you don't want that heavy, smoky nature or that overpoweringly sweet nature that bourbon can sometimes have. This just seems like a brighter, lighter cousin of it. Yeah, I totally agree. I think I'd probably be in that 38 to 40 range of a higher end whiskey. I'm very impressed with this. Keep it up. Good stuff. So Three Court also has two other varieties of whiskey. They have their uh, Amplify Rye whiskey, which is 95 proof. And then they also have a what they call 12 bar reserve whiskey, which is their 107 proof uh, barrel proof bourbon. So we'd love to try those at some time. I will say thank you so much to Three Chord for sending us this bottle. We really, really appreciate this. I'm going to have to remember this one at the end of the season when we come to talking about our favorite whiskeys of the year. Because even though it's we're featuring it on a bonus episode, I think this really could be in contention for one of my favorite whiskeys this season. Yeah, I, w- I would totally agree. I think that Three Chords is an impressive whiskey. I would love to get our hands on some of their other varieties and actually include it as a full review for an episode. Wink, wink. Send them along, Three Chord. Bring them on down. All right, Brad, what do you say we get back into talking about our top five movies we'd like to see remade? Let's get to it. All right, so that was Three Chord Blended Bourbon, a whiskey that Brad and I both really, really liked. Brad, what do you say you hit us with your number three film on your top five list? So the third film on my list, and I I will fully out myself, 
This is a movie that I saw and was just like, yeah, it's okay. It was a decent movie. But I was convinced by a very important YouTuber named NerdRider1 that this could have been a spectacular movie. And that movie is Passengers. Came out in 2016, starring Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence. Passengers was a very interesting sci-fi movie that just kind of like was dull and it, it was interesting enough, but it wasn't great. And after watching the Nerdwriter video on this movie, I think that this could have been considered one of the modern sci-fi horror classics if they had simply done the movie in a slightly different manner, if they had mixed up the timeline a little bit, and if they had followed Jennifer Lawrence as the main character of the movie rather than Chris Pratt. I, I just think that they had, once again, I said this earlier, I think they had the bones of a great movie but they just didn't quite perform in the way that they should have. The story could have been super interesting, and I would love to see this movie remade. Yeah, Brad, I remember that Nerdwriter video you're referring to, and his big argument, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was that they basically should have rearranged the structure of the movie so that what you do get in the film as the sort of first act, where Chris Pratt wakes up Jennifer Lawrence's character should have been saved for like a big reveal in act three and that the movie would have had a lot more emotional weight if they had done that. But the way that it's presented now, it was kind of a letdown because you knew exactly what happened from the beginning of the film. There was no tension to it. Yeah, exactly. If you had followed Jennifer Lawrence as she wakes up on this passenger ship and has Chris Pratt just sitting next to her, then you never know, is Chris Pratt a good guy or a bad guy? You're not sure. He's charming, but he seems to be holding some sort of a secret. And that way, when it's revealed that Chris Pratt is the one who woke her up and that they're stuck together for the rest of their lives, you know, on this empty ship, it, it would have had so much more of an emotional impact. And I genuinely think that the movie could have been considered a sci-fi classic. All right, well, my number three pick, Brad, is going just back to last decade. Well, I guess we're in 2020 now, so back back to the aughts. And we're following the greatest actor of our time, Nicolas Cage. I want to see a remake or maybe a reboot of the National Treasure franchise. And this was a movie that audiences really, really loved and critics kind of crapped all over. And I think the reason for it is because, you know, it was, a, it was a Disney movie. And I think that they made it as fun and as fluffy and as light as they possibly could while still being a live action, you know, action adventure film. It was a great PG movie. I do think that if we took the Disney out of it all and we added a little bit more stakes, maybe a little bit more, I don't want to advocate for violence, but I think if... if we had seen the effect of the, the evil people pursuing the Declaration of Independence, it would have been a really great film. And I think overall, the sort of action-adventure film is a really a dying breed in Hollywood anymore. I just rewatched the 1999 The Mummy a few weeks ago, and that movie is goofy, but I love it dearly because it, it's in the same vein as like an Indiana Jones. And we just aren't getting those kind of movies anymore. And I think a really natural way to kind of inject that back into Hollywood would be to take National Treasure, bump it to like a PG-13 kind of movie and release it for grownups. I think that I would really like to return to that world. I had a lot of fun watching that movie. I do think it was limited in a lot of ways, and I think that we could do more with it. Yeah, I mean, honestly, to combine an earlier movie you mentioned, why not just make it a mashup of National Treasure and Frankenstein, where he discovers the secrets of bringing people back to life and he creates his own monster? And then that monster turns out to be Hitch, and he hooks him up with a woman. Yeah! Oh, dude. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, honestly, I, I genuinely like your idea. I, I think that the National Treasure movies were absolutely fun and invigorating and interesting. You know, it, was, it, it kind of was a Indiana Jones type of movie that just travels from place to place, location to location. You have fun action scenes and set pieces. I really love the National Treasure movies, and I think that they could be done again and done well. All right, Brad, that takes us to our number two picks. So why don't you go ahead and hit us with your number two? My number two film is another movie that we have reviewed in the past, 
And I think that we probably hinted at this in our review of that movie, which is... The Great Escape, directed by John Sturgis, came out in 1963. Bob, I just think that when you and I listed who we thought could play the characters in that movie of, you know, of modern actors, it just sparked in my imagination a modern remake of The Great Escape, and I have been yearning to see it ever since. I think it could be a super fun World War II ensemble cast movie that would just be just as well received now as it was then. And I just, it's such a great movie, and I think we could do a modern version of it, and it would be awesome. Brad, I totally understand where you're coming from. I think this is one of those movies that I would be afraid to remake, though, because as much as I want to see those modern actors in it, I just don't know how much you could really improve on the original. Like, do you really think we could make it better than the first one? Bob, I had a feeling that you were going to ask me that question, and I'm going to answer it like this. You know, right now, 1917 hasn't quite come out yet, but you saw an advanced screening of it, which I'm very jealous of. What if they filmed it in the same vein as Birdman in 1917 and the entire movie was one shot? Hmm. I don't know if you could do that once you get to, like, the third act when they're all in different places, though. Yeah, that's true. I I think that that might be a difficult part, but it might be interesting to do that, you know, style of cinematography for the first two acts of the movie. Yeah. And then move into, you know, the split shots of, you know, where the guys go. I think you're onto something, Brad. You'd have to have some other like layer to it that hasn't been done before. And I think doing long takes like that would be a really interesting way to go. I wouldn't be opposed to seeing a remake of this because it's just such a fun movie. I just worry about when we remake movies and you know that the best case scenario is that it's as good as the original, which means that chances are it's going to be worse than the original. So let's just hope that if they ever do remake that movie, that we can hope that it'll be as good as that 1963 classic. Oh, for sure. So my number two. I feel like I kind of cheated a little bit here because what I wrote down was Pearl Harbor. And I don't necessarily mean that I want a remake of the Michael Bay Pearl Harbor movie, because for those of us who have seen it, once you get to the attack on Pearl Harbor, that movie, it really kind of blows me away for about 45 minutes. But everything around it, the love triangle between Ben Affleck and Josh Hartnett and Kate Beckinsale is like eye rollingly bad. And that movie is way too freaking long. But I do think that we are due for another telling of the Pearl Harbor story. It is such a harrowing story of war and heroism and something that really, you know, roused the U.S. out of this policy of isolationism and into World War II. And especially, you know, I was just listening to a podcast today about the movie Dunkirk, and I really loved that movie. It's not my favorite film of all time, but it's about this microcosm, this moment in history where the British people even today really rally around that as a moment of national pride. And I think Pearl Harbor is one of those moments for the United States where, it, you know, it's a date which will live in infamy. We rally around the fact that we were attacked by the Japanese and it, it jumped us into World War II, but it also sparked so many acts of heroism that came from it. I think with a better direction, a better story behind it, and one that focused more on the attack itself, you could really have a great, great war movie made out of Pearl Harbor. Yeah, I mean, and this, you know, would be the third kind of major remaking of it. You know, you had Tora 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 in yep. 1970. Yep. And so I think that this is an awesome opportunity to kind of revisit a huge historical moment in U.S. history. You know, I'm thinking about a Netflix special I watched recently where they talked about the Japanese commanders, you know, the grand military commanders, and how they had one person in the group who kind of, you know, it was his job to bring up the worst case scenario. And he basically said, like, what if we attack Pearl Harbor And it doesn't crush their hopes and dreams. What if it actually wakes up a sleeping giant, which is exactly what happened? I think you could make an interesting movie that instead of focusing on just the attack, you know, what if it focused on the leaders of the two nations at the times and what was going on in that historical era? I I think you could take the Pearl Harbor narrative in so many different directions. It could be a phenomenal remake. 
Yeah, and I think it's really interesting that you brought up in 1917 when you were talking about The Great Escape because I had that in the back of my mind thinking about Pearl Harbor. The great thing about movies like Dunkirk and 1917 and even to a lesser extent the movie Atonement, which has a great Dunkirk sequence in it, is that they have these really, really long shots where things are like exploding and it's long tracking shots that are just dynamic. And I I think about the best shot in the movie Pearl Harbor is the shot where you watch the bomb fall out of the Japanese plane and it follows the bomb all the way down onto the deck of the ship. There are so many opportunities for those long takes as you just kind of circle around and see the entire U.S. fleet being destroyed around you. I really think that it could be a harrowing war picture and I'd love to see it remade. Well, my number one film that I would like to see remade is actually a series of films And if you listened to our last top five bonus episode, you're going to be very familiar with it. The film that I think most needs to be remade is a very recent film, and that would be The Hobbit Trilogy. And Bob, I know that we talked about this just a few weeks ago, and so I'm not going to get into my disgust with what was actually made. But what I'm going to focus on is the simple fact that The Hobbit at its core is one of the most beautiful and fun stories that has ever been written. And I truly think that if they did a remake of these movies, where it was just two movies, I think they could do such a better job if they stayed faithful to the books in the way that Peter Jackson did with the original Lord of the Rings trilogy. Brad, I know I've told you this before, but I actually really prefer The Hobbit to The Lord of the Rings in terms of the book, because I read The Hobbit when I was a kid, and... It didn't have the sort of level of intricate detail, and I was never really on board for that level of detail in The Lord of the Rings, and I always found The Hobbit to be just this fun, exciting adventure that, you know, had moments of peril, but it was ultimately a book that I was engulfed in and engaged in as a kid, and I wish they had taken that approach with the movies instead of trying to, like, over-dramatize them with this excess baggage of the Lord of the Rings mythology if they had just made one, maybe two movies and really stuck to what was great about the Hobbit book, then it would have been phenomenal. And I completely agree with you. I, I would have loved to have seen Guillermo del Toro's take on this. I still think maybe someday we could get somebody in, in that vein that could remake a Hobbit. And I would, I would be on board to go plunk down my 10, 12, $15 to watch that again. Yeah, and I'm going to take a controversial tack here. One of my struggles with the idea of doing a remake is that at this point, I don't think that we can have Sir Ian McKellen play Gandalf again. And so my struggle is, I think that he is the absolute perfect character for Gandalf. I do not think you will ever find an actor better suited to play Gandalf than him. And so I would be curious if they were to make an animated version of The Hobbit that was a one, maybe two movie series, what would you think about that? An animated version? An animated version. Like the one that they made like back in the 70s? Not like the one they made back in the 70s, because that, <laughs> that one is not impressive. Like, honestly, think about if the creative minds at Pixar took the story of The Hobbit and turned it into an animated film, I just think that they could do a spectacular job with it. Yeah, I completely agree. Honestly, any any new iteration of The Hobbit, I'm on board for, because it can't be any more disappointing than what we got from Peter Jackson. Yeah, and man, I hate that we still have to say that, but it was bad, Bob. It was, it was bad. It was really bad. All right, let's move on from The Hobbit. Well, Brad, before I get to my number one, I want to go over to our Discord channel where we asked our listeners to tell us what their favorite film that they'd like to see remade might be. And we got some really great responses. We got one from a user called Strange Dabs Gaming who said, Dragon Ball Z, the first movie was absolutely horrible in my opinion. I would love to have a full CGI Dragon Ball Z remake or a live action one that was done properly. Uh, the user Dorian said that they like to see Green Lantern remade. Amen to that. Oh, and we for had, sure. We had a couple people get into an argument about E.T. One person said they really want to see E.T. remade, and then three people jumped on their case and basically said, I can't imagine that going well. E.T. is not a movie that needs to be remade. Brad, what are your thoughts on the remake of E.T.? Man, I my honest thoughts on E.T. being remade is that you could do a much better job with the animatronics, the you know the puppeteering, whatever you want to call it. 
But honestly, I just don't think that the story itself of E.T. is that interesting. I think if you remade the movie and maybe changed a few key elements of that, you could do a good job with it. But I, yeah, sure. Go for it. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to reveal my number one now. And it is a comedy from the year 1963. It was a three-hour movie that was filmed in Cinerama. It was a huge, epic film, and at the end of the day, it was just this screwball comedy starring every comedian in the known universe. And I'm talking about the film, It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. Oh, Bob, like, what a great pick. I absolutely love this movie, and I think that it could be the perfect ensemble movie to bring into the modern era. I think that what cinema really is missing now is one of those movies that you just sheerly go see for the spectacle of it. This was a movie that's like, think think about what I just said. It's a three hour long movie and it's a slapstick screwball comedy and it features every comedian you've ever seen. And like somehow that all works and somehow it made a whole bunch of money. And I think that you could sell a movie like that as hard to believe as that might be. I would go see a remake of that movie featuring like almost the exact same script with every comedian known to man today. And it could still be three hours long and I would still go see it because it's just such a fun idea for a movie. It's this movie about people who happen to be driving on the same highway at one time and they see a man drive off the side of the road. And as his as he's dying on the side of the road, he tells them that he's got a bunch of money buried under this big letter W. And they all have this zany race to go find this money before everybody else does. And it pulls in hundreds of supporting characters and bit parts as everybody races to this one park to dig up this money that's under a giant W. They did remake this movie in the early 2000s as a movie called Rat Race. And it was kind of this lower budget, really poorly constructed, really poorly written movie. It had Cuba Gooding Jr., and John Cleese and Rowan Atkinson. It had some good people in it, but it was just a really bad movie. And I would love to see a remake of this film that stuck closer to the original script, that had more comedy writers behind it, with the level, you know, minds the level of things like The Office that are really pouring some really great visual gags and punchlines into this thing. And I think we could really see a great comedy movie made if they chose to remake it today. Yeah, Bob, I just love the ideas of of pairings that you could put in this movie. I mean, could you imagine like Patton Oswalt and Kevin Hart, uh, you know, acting alongside one another and Steve Martin and Zach Galifianakis bouncing off one another? Like there's just so many pairings of funny comedians that I think could make this a great movie in the modern era. Absolutely. I think Steve Martin would be a great choice for the Milton Burrow character. But then you've got, I mean, every stand up that you know could be in this movie. You could have Dave Chappelle in this movie. You could have John Mulaney in this movie. I just, the possibilities are endless. And, you know, you think about Spencer Tracy as kind of the main detective that's chasing them all down. Like, who better than Tom Hanks to be in a movie like this? He's basically returning to his character in Catch Me If You Can. Like, I want this movie. I want a Steven Spielberg remake of It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. Get it I, done, Hollywood. Yes, do it. And I also demand that Norm MacDonald finds his way into this cast. <laughs> oh, he'll be in there somewhere, I'm sure. Yeah, Bob, I think you've chosen a great number one. I, You know, in different ways, I think The Hobbit desperately needs to be remade. But in a different way, you know, I think about ensemble movies in the modern era And you think about those crappy, terrible, you know, 2000s rom-com ensemble movies like Valentine's Day. Like, like that's what children know today as an ensemble movie. And that's sad to me. Like the, the more we go on with this podcast, the more I'm convinced we need to get a modern ensemble movie in the books. So those are our top five movies we want to see remade. We'd love to hear your feedback. Are you Team Brad? Are you Team Bob? Do you have your own thoughts? You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, at Film Whiskey. Or you can give us a call. Our number is 216-800-5923. Once again, the number is 216-800-5923. Call in and let us know, what movie would you like to see remade? For the Film and Whiskey Podcast, I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. We'll see you next time.